With a name like Galen Greaser and living in Texas, I'm always on the lookout for other unusual names. <laughs> the land office contains a few of these winter names. We have files under the name of Pleasant Storms and Pleasant Bull and Socrates Darling and Daring Greg and Gory Gary and Precious Seats and Hairbird Weatherford, among others. Our next speaker also has something of an unusual name, but if his parents had realized how productive he would be in his professional career, they might have considered, him naming, uh, considered naming him Prolific Cummings. <laughs> Author or editor of 10 books and many articles, the esteem he has earned in the historical community has been confirmed by his appointment as the second official state historian of Texas. Professor of history at Austin College, a member of the most prominent professional societies and associations in the field of Texas history. His most recent publication is the award-winning biography, Emily Austin of Texas, which he will also be signing at the conclusion of this morning's event. Please welcome to speak on the subject of the coming of the Anglos and the impresario system in Texas, Dr. Light Cummings. And thank you for mentioning the book signing. Frank and I will be signing books. Be sure to ask about our buying in bulk discount. I live in a part of the state Sherman, Texas, where Austin College is located, known as Baja, Oklahoma. <laughs> Each year across the Red River, we experience an invasion in October. Numerous red painted vehicles coming south down Highway 75 and 35 to attend OU Weekend. <laughs> coming with them is the annual invasion of alien respiratory germs that strike those of us in that area of the state. And so I must admit both as an apology and a warning that I'm suffering from the last vestiges of my annual boomer sooner dry hacking cough. <laughs> Hopefully, however, as it interrupts me, it will be later rather than sooner in my remarks. <laughs> as I talk about the coming of the Anglos and the Empresario system in Texas. Texas is the story of land. Land is why we are here. Land brought us. Land shaped our civilization. And land is the platform and the stage upon which we will live our future. Land ties us together in ways that we do not see in all other parts of the United States. And of course, for many of us in this room today, and for much of our culture, our system of land and our views of land is a unique blend of Hispanic and Anglo traditions. The Anglo-American settlement of Texas in the 1820s <coughs> and 1830s constitutes a significant chapter in the history of the Lone Star State. As such, it was an era of historical development that first attracted the attention of our early historians from the very beginnings of scholarship on Texas history. Henderson Yoakum, one of my predecessors on the faculty of Austin College, wrote in his 1856 book about the influx of English speakers into the state as the start of our history. Seventy years later, Professor Eugene C. Barker wrote on the activities of Stephen F. Austin under the guise of him being the first and great American Anglo frontiersman who er deservedly earned the honor the father of Texas. Most Texas history textbooks today follow this historical interpretation. They highlight the impresario era as the beginning of Anglo-American Texas, and appropriately so. For the most parts, however, such interpretive treatments of this crucial time in Texas history have a very simplistic and in some cases misleadingly brief uh, consideration of the complexities involved in the impresario era. In fact, there is a much more complex and intricate story 
to the historical interpretation of the Anglo-American experience, the historical context, the institutional background, and the demographic development of the impresario era in Texas is actually something that is much older, much more established, and much more significant to the broader story of Spanish and Mexican Texas than simply the arrival of Moses Austin at San Antonio de Bejar in the 1820s. Historical interpretation for any given time or place is always shaped by viewpoint. And of course, the historical viewpoint under which much of the history of the impresario era has been written is that of the Anglo-American. In fact, to read in textbooks today about the impresario era, one can say that it sort of springs fully grown from the last vestiges of Spanish and Mexican government in Texas, and the first beneficiary was, in fact, Moses Austin, who had, to be, who had the foresight to be the first person from the United States to have been in the right place at the right time. Such a viewpoint brings an exceptionalism and a historical uniqueness to the impresario era, which is simply not the case. When you look at it in the larger and chronologically extended context of both the Anglo-American westward movement and also from the viewpoint of the development of Spanish and Mexican land tenure policies. And so my remarks today will move back and forth between a North American, Anglo-American viewpoint of the impresario era and a Hispanicized Spanish and Mexican viewpoint to conceptualize the impresario era of Texas in the 1820s as only one chapter, admittedly a final chapter, in the ongoing interaction between Spain, Mexico, and the United States that, English, uh, that began when English speakers, for the Anglo-American viewpoint, arrived in the Mississippi Valley during the decades after the American Revolution. What happened here in Texas was set in motion by events in the generation after the American Revolution in places like Missouri and Louisiana. The impresario era also had its roots and its heritage deep in the historical institutions of, Fran of Spanish frontier settlement that began in the very beginning years of Spain's expansion into what we now call the Spanish borderlands. Hence, today, what we call the impresario era can be seen as the meeting here in Texas, on our land, of two different streams of historical development. First, the evolving nature of Spanish and Mexican frontier institutions across several settlements of Hispanicized expansion northward from Mexico, and also the geographical expansion of the United States frontier into the Mississippi Valley and Gulf Coast in the years after the American Revolution. The coming together of the Spanish-Mexican legal traditions of land settlement, merging with the expansion of Anglo-American North America, first in Spanish Louisiana and then later in Mexican Texas, created what for us we call the impresario era. The, be the end of a process rather than the beginning of one. It is therefore first necessary to examine the historical origins of the impresario era in Texas history within the larger parameters of historical development as a frontier strategy in Spanish and Mexican tradition for territorial settlement. Back in the 1920s and 1930s, Historian Herbert Eugene Bolton made much of his opinion that there were three institutions of the Spanish frontier, the mission, the presidio, and the civil settlement. Although Bolton was correct in this tripart categorization of Spanish frontier institutions, his categorization was oversimplistic because he failed to include other institutions of the Spanish frontier in his typology, especially that of the adelantado. Anyone who speaks Spanish knows that the word adelantar means to advance, to pass, to go beyond, to enter. It also carries in its meaning the notion of progress rather than retreat. For that reason, a singular frontier institution in Spain settled, centered on that of the adelantado, 
The Adelantado was the person, the agent of Spanish government, who advanced Spanish civilization by uh, directing its implementation, its transportation, its translation, and its movement into new areas where it had not yet existed. The Adelantado, as an agent, first became important to Spain during the medieval era of the Reconquista, in which the Spanish kings enlisted the frontier military leaders, adelantados, to direct the taking of territory from the Moors who had invaded the Iberian Peninsula from North Africa. The frontier military captains, known as adelantados, received special commissions or contracts from the crown to reclaim territories that had been taken by these Islamic invaders. But these adelantados were far more than battlefield or military commanders, which was, of course, part of their duties. They additionally, they were civil governors, judges, and colonization land agents who oversaw concurrently the settlement of the territories they were reclaiming. Often as not, their retaking of the Iberian Peninsula from the Moors involved a large, broad-based, and all-encompassing military-civilian expedition known as the Entrada, uh, which many of us are familiar with. And this involved the Adelantado leading into these new areas, a complex, sort of by our language today, prefabricated, prefabricated settlement of church officials, military forces, civil settlers, uh, along with their families who composed a complete community ready to be established in one huge founding. The reconquest of Iberia by the kings of Castile and their successors came largely as a result of this institution of the Adelantado, which of course was translated to the New World. Christopher Columbus, making landfall in the Western Hemisphere, had with him, in his pocket, a document commissioning him as an adelantado. And so it was only natural that the institution of the adelantado and its agency for land settlement be translated to the New World. And in fact, the, some of the best-known names in Spanish settlement of the Americas were adelantados, including Diego de Velasco, Hernán Cortés, Pedro Arias de Avila, Francisco Pizarro, and a host of other colonizers. Uh, and in fact, by the time Spanish colonial expansion came into Texas, the full-scale institution of the Adelantado, however, was changing. And it became somewhat simplified as such agents in the late 18th and early 19th century no longer made elaborate entradas of unsettled areas. This had become the case because by the early 18th century, the entire North American continent had been comprehended at least in theoretical point of territorial domination by France, Spain, and the United States, so Great Britain rather, and, and although there was still much unsettled and unexplored land, the furthest, furthest reaches of the continent had been claimed by by 1700 in European point of law, and the result of this was that the corporate nature of the Adelantado heritage changed, starting in the 1790s when Alonso de Leon and Father Damien Massenet brought the first Spanish establishments into Texas. So the institution had become far more warlike and bellicose and much more oriented towards civil and religious settlement. This continued under people like Domingo Terán de los Ríos, the Marquez de San Miguel de Aguayo, and finally, in a government coordinated attempt, the arrival of the Isleños as settlers, which also took place under various kinds of adelantado arrangements. Spanish settlement, therefore, in Texas, was always corporate in nature, descended from the adelantado concept of land settlement, always superintended by officials who served as implementing agents, directing and coordinating the settlement activities as part of a government-sponsored policy of community and civil settlement. These basic institutions would, of course, result in legal policies of land settlement that we would later know in the 1820s as the Empresario era. To understand what happened in Texas during the Empresario era, we must also switch 
to the Anglo-American viewpoint and consider the Anglo-American expansion into the lower Mississippi Valley and Gulf Coast as one continuous process that began in the 1770s and did not end until the 1840s when the Republic of Texas adopted the last vestiges of a Spanish Mexican empresario system uh, for the structuring of republic colonization contracts. So the migration of English speakers from first British colonial America and then the United States into Spanish Louisiana and Texas occurred in three distinct waves. From the 1770s to 1785, they arrived to settle British West Florida, a crown colony founded north of New Orleans in what is today the Baton Rouge area into Mississippi. Second, there was a wave from the 1780s to the 18 teens in which a considerable number of immigrants, mostly from the United States, arrived in Spanish territory, again occurring under a modified adelantado system, which began to be called in those years the impresario system. And finally, after 1820, Anglo-American settlers flocked, at least initially in the first year or so, to Spanish Texas and thereafter to Mexican territory in Texas, also uh, under the guise of the impresario system. Of course, it is the latter stage of this one long demographic movement that we in Texas today call the impresario era. During the first stage, the British colonial settlement of West Florida, patterns were set in motion that would in fact continue well into Texas in the 1820s. In fact, one of the things that the English settlers brought with them was cadastral survey. As geographer Milo B. Newton has noted of English speakers who began arriving in the lower Mississippi Valley in the 1770s, using their cadastral survey techniques, they created a tangible order on the land and landholding patterns that remain consistent today all across the Mississippi Valley. Indeed, the various documentary sources uh, about this early migration into Spanish Louisiana are replete with the names of early settlers, Anglo-American English speakers, who arrived in the region and stayed. They brought with them British common law, Anglo-American legal behaviors, and in fact this can be seen in the survey of land grant filings, land sales between private parties, notorial transactions, and business matters including slave transfers, conveyances, mortgages, wills, powers of attorney, and other legal activities which existed concurrently uh, hand in hand with Spanish law in Spanish Louisiana during the 1770s, 80s, and 90s. In fact, these people came to stay. A 1774 map of the lower Mississippi Valley shows that over one-third of the grantees who came to Spanish Louisiana and later Spanish Missouri remained in their in possession of their land well into the 20th century. In fact, in a number of cases, the children of these people with names like Bowie, Travis, and Austin moved west of the Sabine as uh, these West Florida families, as they became known, would later appear in Texas. And in fact, the Louisiana survey records in the William L. Clements Library, which document the landholding patterns of this initial Anglo-American migration in the Mississippi Valley, show that there was a tremendous familial movement demographically across the land from the Mississippi Valley into Texas. In fact, a second era of English-speaking migration into the lower Mississippi Valley began after the American Revolution in 1783 when a diplomatic event gave most of the entire lower Mississippi Valley to the control of Spain. This laid the legal groundwork for what would become the impresario era in Texas. It was largely the work of the Spanish envoy in Washington, D.C., to the infant United States government, a man named Diego de Gardoque, and the governor of Spanish Louisiana, Esteban Miro, who resided at New Orleans. They had a problem. The problem was that now, after the American Revolution, considerable stretches of the land where these Anglo-American settlers had been living now belonged to Spain. 
How could these people be legitimized as Spanish citizens? And more importantly, how could additional English speakers flooding into the area from the infant United States be accommodated? Gardoki and Moreau, in effect, created the impresario system that we'd, we, we would see in Texas by enunciating policies that blended together the Spanish corporate system flowing from the adelantado model with the Anglo-American propensity to settle the land on individual land grants by family units. Gardoki sought to encourage migration into Spanish territory in Louisiana and Mississippi as part of his plan to establish a population of English-speaking frontier folk who might be a counterbalance to the growing uh, interest in the area of the United States. And so the Spanish envoy began from Washington, D.C., granting large tracts of land to various land agents, who he called empresarios, including a revolutionary war veteran by the name of George Morgan, for the purpose of establishing English-speaking colonies along the Mississippi River. Governor Esteban Moreau shared with Gardoki in Washington, D.C., <coughs> the hope that dissatisfied potential Westerners <coughs> might expand into the Appalachian areas and further provide stability against the encroaching territorial advancement of the United States. It was for this reason, for example, that not only did Moreau support the issuing of empresarial contracts, he also schemed with that frontier rascal James Wilkinson, a United States Army general who would also become a Texas empresario during the summer of 1787 and secretly enlisted General Wilkinson as a spy on the king of Spain's payroll. Moreau promulgated a degree that legitimized all British land grants held by the residents of West, West Florida, and in fact, he also, in this decree, legitimized as governor of Spanish Louisiana the empresarial system which had been recommended and implemented by Gardoque with George Morgan. Empresarios were agents under Moreau's decree who would organize the planting of entire communities, they did so by applying to Governor Moreau and receiving colonization contracts. They had to have their land surveyed by Spanish surveyors, not using the cadastral system but the older meets and bounds system, and file necessary papers to have their large land patents uh, uh, legitimized following the existing colonial land uh, policies. One of the very first of these empresarios of Spanish Louisiana other than George Morgan, to take advantage of Governor Moreau's proclamation was Felipe Nering, as he's more popularly known, better known to us as the Baron de Bastrop. Moses Austin and others in the 1790s would also sponsor the creation of new English-speaking settlements from St. Louis south on the Mississippi River down to the environs of Baton Rouge. This influx of empresario-sponsored settlers followed, of course, uh, uh, both sides of the river. And in fact, uh, the survey records of Spanish Louisiana under these empresario grants tell a story of a virtual diaspora of English-speaking settlers coming into the area. In fact, the survey records of Spanish uh, surveyor Carlos Laveau Trudeau, Trudeau today held in the historic New Orleans collection, constitute a wonderful treasure trove of the various individual land grants superintended by these empresarios, many of whom turn out to be the parents and grandparents of people living in Texas at the time of the Texas Revolution. The entirety of this settlement then occurred as a result of these empresarial contracts exactly like those that would be seen in Texas during the 1820s. Uh, one notable example of this, as I already intimated, was in fact the work of Felipe Nering, the Baron de Bastrop. Having fred, fled his native Holland because of various indiscretions, he arrived in Spanish New Orleans in 1793, where he engaged in a series of grandiose 
business schemes and commercial activities, none of which became financially productive or lucrative. And in 1796, Bastrop signed an empresario colonization contract with the governor of Louisiana in which he agreed to sponsor, direct, and superintend the settlement of families in the northern part of the present-day state of Louisiana along the Washita River on 850,000 acres that had been granted to him for this purpose. He recruited most of the colonists from the environs of Louisville, Kentucky, and although Bastrop was never able to bring into the settlement enough numbers to have the contract fully implemented, uh, the town of Bastrop, Louisiana today memorializes that colony as the center of his activities. And although the Spanish government eventually canceled his land contract for not bringing in enough families, he was instrumental in inducing other impresarios to greater successes. It was Bastrop's experiences in Spanish Louisiana that no doubt had a heavy influence on preparing the way for what he did 20 years later in Texas and, of course, his meeting of Stephen F. Austin dates from the mid-1790s in Louisiana. Others of these Louisiana empresarios included people like Jose Piernas, Luis Villemont, William Murray, and, of course, George Morgan, so that the concept of the colonization land agent in Spanish law the empresario had become well established in the practices of the Spanish government as a cooperative strategy to implement the English-speaking colonization of the Mississippi Valley region. Spain sought this corporate colonization as a potential counterbalance to the unregulated and unsupervised influx of Anglo-Americans which the Spanish government realized would have come anyway. It was, of course, as we all know, another one of the Spanish Louisiana empresarios who set in motion what would become the empresario era in Texas, Moses Austin. The story of Moses Austin is well known to Texas history and certainly does not need to be related here at this time and place in a building name for his son. It is nevertheless, uh, in fact, uh, instructive to examine the legalities of Spanish law by which the elder Austin became a land agent in Spanish Missouri, a district of Louisiana, in the 1790s, for this had a direct impact on what would happen in Texas. Austin had been operating a lead mining operation in the New River Valley of Missouri in the early 1790s when he heard of lucrative lead deposits in the area south of Spanish uh, St. Louis. This ore rich area had later, or had first been settled by the French, later by the Spanish. Moses read descriptions of these mines written by a Frenchman named Louis de de la Seuse, who noted, quote, This is a country where a great quantity of iron, lead, and copper ore exists. And so in December of 1797, Armed with letters of recommendation to Spanish officials in the region, Moses Austin arrived at St. Genevieve, where he signed an agreement with the Spanish commandant, an empresario contract, to develop mines in the region in turn for his contract. Austin took an oath of allegiance to the king of Spain and promised to become a Roman Catholic, the latter which apparently did not trouble his family because... uh, As Episcopalians, once they arrived in the Missouri district, they attended the Catholic Church at St. Genevieve because it it provided uh, uh, worship uh, similar to their own sensibilities. In fact, Moses and uh, Mariah Austin had their youngest son, James E.B. Austin, uh, uh, baptized in the St. Genevieve Catholic Church. Moses Austin established the town of Potosi, we would like to call it, although in Missouri you may know it is called Potosi, which sounds like a dental condition to me. Uh, I would not want to suffer from Potosi. But at any rate, Austin there began his uh, his empresario uh, uh, activities. Uh, uh, He brought into the area in the late 1790s some 50 families. They, They founded a town that was pleasantly situated in the center of the mining district, 
In fact, it uh, had, uh, as one observer said, uh, 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 it was built in a better style than the other villages in the country. And in fact, many of the individuals who Austin brought to his Potosi colony would later become individuals who followed him to Texas, including people like William Stevenson and others, uh, Hugh Hagen, uh, uh, John Rice Jones, who would actually establish a plantation near that of his daughter, Emily Austin Bryan Perry, in Brazoria County. It is, of course, the story of Moses Austin in Potosi that is the unknown story of the Empresario era in Texas. It's uncertain exactly when Moses Austin began considering the idea of a colonization venture in Spain, but uh, undoubtedly it occurred for two reasons. First, the Transcontinental Treaty of 1819, in fact, gave some on the western frontier the hope that the Spanish government might issue land titles in Texas to uh, Louisianans and others coming in west of the, from east of the Sabine, as well, various filibustering and abortive settlement attempts uh, during the first two decades of the 19th century, of course, uh, piqued interest on the frontier in Texas settlement. And finally, the great uh, panic and depression of 1819, which wiped out much of the Austin family fortune, became, in fact, a significant impetus for Austin to begin what would be for him a repeat story of success, a second empresario colonization venture. What is not as well understood, however, is the salient fact that events and opinions in the Spanish government in Texas had also arrived simultaneously at the point where the issuance of colonization contracts similar to those in Spanish Louisiana a quarter century earlier now appeared to be an attractive policy at San Antonio de Bejar. The Spanish province of Texas in the second decade of the 19th century was a province in abject turmoil and crisis. As much of the entire vice regency of New Spain was, the frontier areas of Texas had been significantly threatened and discomfited by problems with Native Americans, coupled to filibustering incursions from the United States, and finally, additionally, by the abortive revolution for independence in Mexico that began in 1810, the latter of which rocked the northern frontier and Texas to its very foundations with the Las Casas revolt. In fact, uh, no better example of this disruption can be seen, of course, than the Anglo-American invasion of Texas that is sometimes called the Gutierrez McGee expedition during 1812, 1813, a huge force of several hundred men under Bernardo Gutierrez de Lara and Augustus B. McGee uh, presented itself in Texas as a marauding band of filibusters, but in that regard, the Tejano population of Texas uh, played an interesting role. In fact, they transferred much of their loyalty to the anti-Spanish invaders, and this uh, culminated in the most forgotten and undeservedly so battle in Texas history, the Battle of Medina, which occurred on August the 18th, 1813, at a location near San Antonio. At the Battle of Medina, forces loyal to Spain under the command of General Joaquin de Arredondo defeated a Republican army composed of these Anglo-American filibusters and a much larger force of Spanish-speaking Tejanos who, in fact, uh, became a huge bulwark against the Spanish royal uh, forces. Uh, the number of people that died on the Tejano Anglo-American side is certainly unknown, but it is estimated by some historians that approximately two-thirds to three-fourths of the Republican Army of the North, those Tejanos in league with the Gutierrez de Lara invaders, may have lost their lives on the battlefield, which would mean from 800 to 1,200 combatants. Lack of definitive historical research of those who died on the field keeps us from knowing the exact number, but it is, large, it is logical to assume that several hundred Tejano men and boys, at the least, lost, lost their lives at the Battle of Medina. This constitutes a significant population decimation for the province, which has gone largely 
unrecognized by historians, and it, of course, clearly put the Spanish-speaking population of Texas into a dem demographic crisis. This carnage would take any locality well over a generation to rectify the loss of so many men and older boys. Anglo-American migration, I submit, could, could augment the vitality of the surviving Tejano population. And indeed, Tejanos, such as Jose Antonio Navarro, Francisco Ruiz, would indeed embrace the empresario system and Anglo-American settlement, for it could surely provide stability in the face of the horrible demographic crisis the Battle of Medina represented. So it was in this context that Moses Austin arrived in San Antonio de Bejar, seven years after the Battle of Medina, when its wounds most certainly had not healed. And it was at this time that a second burbling movement for independence from Spain was taking place. Thoughts of feudal defenses against Native Americans in Texas, the vestiges of the Las Casas Revolt, the military actions of the Republic Army of the North, and finally the mood of the Tejano population to find allies against centralism must have been on the mind of Governor Antonio Martinez when he decided to uh, approve Moses Austin's 1820 request to settle 300 families along the Brazos River in an exact duplicate of the 1797 contract that Moses Austin had signed at St. Genevieve. Thus, what began on the reaches of the lower Mississippi Valley for Spain in the decades after the American Revolution came to fruition in Texas in the 1820s. The broad outlines of the empresario movement in Texas comprehend historically the movement of the Anglo-American English-speaking population across the Mississippi Valley. And in fact, when Stephen F. Austin arrived at San Antonio de Bejar in 1822 to fulfill his father's colonization contract, he was the last of the great empresarios in that process who had a direct tie back to the 1780s and 1790s. In fact, the empresario process was also the end result of a long system of legal evolution in land settlement patterns in Spanish-speaking North America that go back to the very beginnings of land tenure in the Spanish-speaking parts of Texas and regions to the south in present-day Mexico. The empresario era in Texas, in net sum, thus represents the end point of a long process that occurred across Anglo-American expansion, and this expansion continued for almost two generations. Indeed, it also represents the final vestiges of the adelantado system as it came to exist in the 19th century. It combined the empresario system, the centralized and corporate characteristics of Spanish New World expansion with the early 19th century need for Mexico to manage, manage English speakers pouring across the Sabine River. Anglo-American residents quickly became accustomed to the empresarial system, eventually adopting its structure to the Republic of Texas. And the land laws of the 1840s, they continued uh, immigration policies under this system. It was, of course, then, the empresarial system that set Texas on the pathway to development that it has enjoyed ever since. Thank you very much.